Good afternoon, viewers, um, and thank you for tuning in to the, this interview with Dr. Jagu, the Vice President of Guyana. And the interest here is to bring transparency and bring Guyanese citizens um, in Guyana and around the world up to date with what are the current affairs, how we are affected, um, or how you are affected, and how the government plans to address issues affecting the citizenry of this country. Dr. Jagdeo, thank you for this opportunity. Um, yes, thank you. Heading off on issues that Guyanese are really concerned with. Recently, there was a local government election, and because of the integral role local government plays in our society, it is the bodies within the communities working to develop this country at the um, level of the community. Can you give the citizenry an update as to where um, local government, the, the sure. completion of the election, sure. the selection and the process itself, where is that at this time? Well, first of all, um, I want to thank you for doing the interview at this time. Um, today, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, is here. And therefore, I've opted out from my customary press conference. And I, but I still thought that we needed to bring some info to people, um, especially those who've been following us on a weekly basis. So I want to assure them that at some later point in time, I'll do, return to the press conference. But uh, we expect the intense discussions today with the Secretary of State and also he will have a press engagement. So I didn't want to crowd the media agenda today. Um, on the issue of local government, um, as you would recognize and the country by now knows that the PPP won these elections overwhelmingly. And I saw some comments now from the opposition and there's and some of their social media activists and the psychophants. The first thing was that they won the elections and they celebrated and now they're they're transforming our victory as an attempt to control Guyana that PPP has some major sinister design to control all of Guyana. We work very hard. Our candidates work very hard. We didn't bully people to vote for us. We carried a positive message of development to them. It was a free election. People had the freedom of choice, which did not never, not all in our entire history, they didn't always have that. But in this case, people had a freedom of choice and they willingly chose the PPP overwhelmingly in many of these communities. So first it was they won the elections and then when the reality sunk in, they're now making this as a bad thing, that our victory is bad for Ghana. What, what, what these elections were about, um, they were about also rejection, not just of APNU's track record, because they have a track record of non-achievement, but was a rejection of the vile things that they use as campaign tools, the racism, the personal attacks, the um, innuendos, all sorts of things, divisive politics that they have utilized. And this was a rejection of that in many of these communities. So I'm extremely pleased with the results of these elections. And now that the results are publicly known, I hope that those APNU supporters, the trolls and others who have been lying to people in the night after the election, that they somehow scored a massive victory, that the people who listened to them and believed them 
would now reconsider anything they've they're going to say in the future or anything they've said in the past because that is what they do all the time, mislead. Play and and they're they they have some outlets, you know, the extreme outlets like the Village Voice and the Burks and the Sherrod Duncans of the world, etc. And people need to reassess um, what they've always heard from these people. Because if they can lie, as we've been saying so blatantly to you on this matter, which could be factually proven, what else would they not lie on? So we came through the elections. We did extremely well. But the process of selecting those who represent us in the NDCs and the tongues that we won had to be an inclusive process. Now, when you have over 2,000 candidates, um, but you have 900 seats, we were lucky that we won nine, over 900 of the 1,200 seats. But you still had over 2,000 candidates. So we had to go through a process involving as many candidates as possible in the selection of the councillors on the PR aspect of the list, not the constituency aspect. And then in the process of selecting who will lead the, the NDCs, like as chair and deputy chair. So we didn't do it in a heavy handed way, like is done by the other parties. We sought to engage. I sent a team out to every region to consult with all of these bodies. And then after that was done, we spoke to them about our expectations, about how they must manage the communities in which, or the councils in which they now, um, or to which they are appointed. So there are some particularly contentious areas Better Hope has been one of those where we've always had complaints about how the affairs of Better Hope and the NDC there, are, the affairs are managed. And it seems as though a lot of infighting and nitpicking among councillors. I invited the entire con council as well as the candidates to Freedom House to have a talk with them about our expectations. The same thing we did with some other councils around the country. So we have emphasized about behavior and attitude in response to residents' concerns. That you can't claim you support the People's Progressive Party when your attitude in relation to people on the ground will drive them away from the party. And that happens in some cases. So we spoke about accountability for the funds, about engagement with the communities, the, that not to take in personality fights into the councils, because this happens sometimes around, around the country. And so by now, I think we've gone through that process and today the swearing-in is taking place of the councils. Um, I've seen a lot of them have um, already been sworn in, including some of the tide areas, like where we had the tide in terms of seats, but we had the majority of the votes. More people voted for us in those areas. So once you apply the formula by law, we will win those areas. And so far that has been predictably done as industry pleasance, um, the elections are completed, Wood, Woodlands, Bel Air, and in Madia. These were three areas where we had equal number of seats, but the PPP won the majority votes in the area. So um, the elections are going as predicted so far, no surprises. And, um, the councils have to now get back to work. So it was it was an important um, thing for us to get 
them elected. Now they're being elected today, but with a clear mandate as to how they will behave. Dr. Jadio, recently one of um, <coughs> the ministers of government became embroiled in a race scandal, uh, specifically <coughs> Minister Dan Lal. Um, the a police report was made, uh, the Ministry of Social Protection became involved, um, allegations were made based on the report, and then the victim recanted. Um, this is documented. Advice was asked from the DPP. Uh, when this all began, the president came out and he requested um, individuals to refrain from making allegations or claiming the, you know, any form of attacks. The, some cross sections of society feel that this has taken its course, this process. The minister has since resigned. Uh, the opposition has chosen to politicize this process. How, in light of the fact, the sensitive nature of issues like this, this is a high profile one, but there are a lot of victims across the country and there are a lot of perpetrators. Um, victims need to feel secure. Because of how this was politicized, it seems that more harm was caused in the whole process than good. How can we ensure that politics is not at the forefront or how your government plan to ensure that politics is not at the forefront when victims are seeking justice? So I can't answer that because really there is no answer to it. We sought to allow the process to work. I can speak for politics from a PPP perspective. And when the allegations were made, we said they must be treated seriously and the process must work. That's what the president said at the beginning. And he said, if at the end of the process, the minister is found guilty, he will face the consequences. Throughout it all, we stayed faithful to the process. We did not engage in political defense of Nigel Darmla. We didn't comment on the victim statement. We said there are agencies of the state that have to deal with these matters by law. The police, child care, the DPP's office. And we allow that process to work. I can't speak for APNU. APNU would politicize in anything. And I don't think now that Nigel Darmlal has resigned, they were calling for his resignation or for him to be fired. He is resigned now, but they still continue the protest. And um, in my view, they had not a single ounce of sympathy or empathy for this girl. They didn't care anything about the accusation or the, the report. For them, it was a political issue. Dharmlal, PPP, member of parliament. So they were not really looking to get justice. They wanted to make a political point. Our objective was that there must be a fair process that leads to justice and, and being fair to both parties to have them present their cases and let the, those cases be determined by the relevant agencies. In politicizing the issue and the circus that emerged from it, with people, some of them who I've seen, I didn't want to get involved, 
who have condoned all sorts of behavior out in the forefront championing the cause of this young girl. Um, in, in making it a political circus, I, uh, I think they put more pressure, not just here, already this is a, a, a big issue, a contentious issue, and a young woman would have a lot of pressure. And then layering on the political pressure of this issue, because I don't, I don't think that she did this as a political issue, but they exploited it as a political issue. And, and they must have put more pressure on this young lady. So I'm, I don't want to get too detailed about my views, but I feel strongly about it, that they don't care anything about this family or this young girl or justice. And therefore, it's a political matter for them. And it was a distraction for them from the defeat that they had at the local government elections. I know um, min uh, former Minister Dan Lalu resigned from his ministerial position and also as an MP. Um, any ideas as to who will be replacing him in as a member of parliament and also who will be holding his position as minister? Yeah. So any updates on that? Ni Nigel Darmlal has been a good minister. Uh, let me say that about him. He's a very efficient person. Efficient person. I've worked with him a long time. And he he is committed to the task of national development. I've seen him work very, very hard. Yeah, and I need to say that today. That he's been a a great asset to the PPP in its work. And he I don't I think this whole matter has taken a toll on him and his psyche and you know, undoubtedly his family. And so I think he needs time to recover from this. And that's why I think he offered his resignation. But I just wanted to say that for the pub public record. Nigel Darnall was extracted from the geographic list of candidates for Region 2. So there are three individuals on that list now, and the member of parliament would have to be, be from one of the be one of the three. And um would that member of parliament move on to be automatically move on to be a minister? No, or no, just a member has of parliament. Has thought been put into who could be holding? Uh, and that, that will be a matter that will be discussed and it's a matter for the president. Okay. Is there a time period on that specific? No, no not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. We have Anand Passat, who is the junior minister in there, and he's been acting and he's doing a good job. Um, one of the issues in the news and that has been put at the forefront of the news is Kaichu News has made former Minister of Natural Resources, um, Raphael Trotman, their poster boy. Mm -hmm. um, Raphael, former Minister Raphael Trotman would have been the person who would have signed the lopsided contract, mm -hmm. um, played an integral role in the signing of that contract. Um, admittedly uh, withheld certain information from the general public. This is said to be in a book that he has written um, since unfortunately he's lost his voice. So his, his um, way of putting information out is through this new book he has. He's been made a poster by, by Kaicho News and now champing in the cause for renegotiation which adds up to being hypocritical. How does, how do you as General Secretary of the PPP and Vice President um, address this? Someone who has been integral all the way speaking about negotiation and how this government, when you were opposition leader, how this government will address renegotiation. You always had a stance. You might have revisited it, look at it, 
how uh, things can be adjusted, but no renegotiation. How do you address this, knowing um, Glenn Lal's motives, knowing uh, Rafael Trotman's history? How do you address these issues? So you just spoke a key word here, knowing Glenn, Glenn Lal's motive. And I don't think enough people know about that because he successfully masked his motive um, by presenting himself as a fighter for Guyanese rights against the big bad foreign companies. But those of us who really know Glenn, Glenn Lyle and what his true ambitions are, I think he has this outsized ego and he doesn't rec realize his own limitations. So he speaks with a level of certainty on matters that he's totally ignorant of. The way that a person who is very familiar with a subject matter will speak. But he knows nothing about it except what he hears. So he is like a parrot. Somebody tells him something, he reflects it. So his motivations are political. Every day that passes, you have some clones around him and some of the and some very corrupt people that we will expose soon when they come out we're going to show who they really are who been lobbying to get work in the oil and gas sector who been egging him on and and stoking his ego so he will jump on any person regardless of whether they have any credibility a tom sanzillo a foreigner from abroad who it's not even, an, I don't even believe it's an academic who believes that we don't need roads in Ghana. We shouldn't spend our money on roads. We must save it. The people of Ghana don't have any right to, to proper roads or anything else. So, and so he's been going, jumping around. Now his latest person who, who supports his cause is Rafael Trotman. Now, People who know Rafael Trotman, they know that he was ill-suited to handle that portfolio. He's not technical in nature. I don't believe he understands anything. And, and, and history has demonstrated and proved us correct on that matter. Anything to do with technical issues. But he has said it's not just Trotman um, who agreed to this contract, the whole cabinet, including people like Ram Jatan and the others, who are quietly saying they're willing to negotiate, but then privately saying that it's a great contract. So I don't, you know, Trotman is for me history. Came, they came, they lied to the people, the AFC, they lied to the people of this country, told them they had great things in mind, they are competent. People saw them at work and they disappeared off the scene. I don't want to be cruel because he's lost his voice and I don't want to be brutal because I can be if I had to characterize their tenure in office, their behavior with this contract which we were critical of, and the, the, the subsequent slimy behavior now, um, as though we don't have that recent history to go back to and judge them by. So I don't pay too much attention to what Trotman has to say now. Glenn Lal will continue to use any individual who he believes supports his cause. That's why he took Adam Harris, the PNC activist, back to run his newspaper. Um, so they will probably push his agenda because they laugh at him, frankly speaking. People like Adam Harris and the others, they make fun of him, the staff. They, some of them call me and, and, and make fun of him 
and he doesn't realize this. They're using his paper, he thinks, to push his agenda when he runs a presidential candidate. The paper is being used for app news agenda, like it was in the past. And therefore, um, we just have to treat Glenn now for what he is, you know, which is a clown, you know, talking about things that he doesn't know and in very vile language. I've made it clear every position that I've had, he loves to call my name, but I don't. He's done that a million times already for the last 20 years or so of my life. It hasn't affected me one bit because, um, but, and I think he does it to basically, and, and he, he does that to just draw attention to himself. So I'm not going to pay too much attention to Glenn Lal and, and the others too much. I, I was wondering in the future, you know, whether I should focus on him because every all the issues are circular. It's the same thing over and over again. It's all oh, the insurance, although we have dealt with that. It's a renegotiation, it's a royalty, it's the stuff. And we we have dealt with every issue, answered every question, given our pos public position on every matter. Yet it comes back, resurfaces in another form in the newspapers. He's a politician now. Dr. Jagu, uh, recently in the news, uh, former Minister Bulkan's sister tried to bring into disrepute the carbon credit agreement, even suggesting that it was illegal. Um, can you speak to that? Janet Bulkan has been a PPP hater too, and they come from that uh, that group of people who live abroad and think that they have all the answers to Ghana and they're the conscience of Ghanaians who live off of advocating for indigenous people and clean environment. They make their money from that. They get invited to write a paper, go to a conference, etc but they never come on the ground and work and walk in these communities and be concerned about the lives of the people there. So the APA tried that. The APA tried to block the funding for the Amerindian communities. 242 villages got a huge allocation of money that they have in their bank accounts that they've started spending from the sale of the for carbon credit. All the villages, the villages want this to be done. They agreed that the resources should be shared among all the villages. The people in the villages have voted on the village development plan. Now 160 of these villages agreed to how they want to spend their share of the for, for carbon credit money and they've submitted that plan to the ministry and they've already started drawing down their money to implement the plan. That's going to change people's lives on the ground, create more jobs, improve their health, access to health, um, address youth issues, a whole range of developmental issues. They don't care. APA tried to block that. They failed by they, by invoking the grievance procedure under the art, the architecture for Red Plus transaction. They failed there. The process was followed. They, they found basically that they had no support whatsoever, AP among the indigenous communities, to stop this. So now they resurrected another group in Upper Mazaruni now to make the same call since the APA failed. And now Janet Bulkan and the others are weighing in. This is what's going to happen. These people live off there like leeches. They suck the blood out of the indigenous communities, um, but not any, any money they raise or anything else. Not a cent will go back for development there. They just are leeches, parasites. And they will continue like this. You're not going to get rid of them. You're not going to get rid of them. So we just have to, in this country, ignore these people and move forward. Once you have the support of the people who live in the communities, 
ultimately it's their lives that matter, not these who live off the advocacy. Dr. Jagir, as of recent for the last uh, three weeks, um, firstly, we are now an oil producing nation, um, fast growing. There's massive development going on across the country. There's lots of money being spent. Um, I do not know, the people do not know exactly what is going on as it relates to the finances and accountability and transparency with the government. Um, for the most part, that should be the job of the opposition to hold down the government and make sure everything is checked in check. Other than the Dharamlal scandal, the opposition has not taken on anything. Is the opposition in Guyana becoming just a voice in the wilderness? I think I think their track record is so bad. And the um, we are correcting so many things they did that they are even embarrassed to speak about them. Um, and when they do speak, it exposes how shallow the content of their speeches are, or is. So take, for example, accountability with public funds. You have seen in the oil and gas sector, the amendment to the Natural Resources Fund Act, the changing in the law that will track every cent of receipt with a 10 years jail term attached to the Minister of Finance if he fails to publish every, every receipt. You've seen a formula replacing um, the complex arrangement that Jordan had in the law that would have allowed him to determine how much will come to the Treasury from the Natural Resources Fund, how much will come to the government for spending. There is a fixed formula now that anyone could apply. Thirdly, we've removed every direct charge on the Natural Resources Fund, and those have to any spending in the oil and gas sector has to be appropriated by the parliament for debate on parliament. And then we've enhanced the reporting relationship and the, the management of the fund by putting in place a board, replacing only the minister was managing the fund. Now there's a board. So we have vastly enhanced the accountability provisions by law now. So what are they going to say? They went and they created the ruckus to when we pass these amendments, you recall that the issue that break up the mace and all of that in parliament. And those antics were to disrupt people from, from identifying the real content of the bill. The content was about improvement and these can be traced back to what we promised to do in opposition. One thing we've been is we're consistent with what we promised. So that's only accountability. So they choose antics and gimmicks to sidetrack the truth or to obfuscate the truth in a lot of these matters because they don't have any other position. On the privacy law, they were opposed to that. The privacy law we said will be coming if we have new ID cards with biometrics and all of that, where you would have new apps, for example, in medical records. So you don't want people to be sharing everybody's records. You know, but the, an electronic system where if you go to the private sector or the public sector, a doctor can access your record. It helps for more efficient health sector. So we decided we're gonna pass privacy laws. They had a big thing to speak about is, oh, the PP wants to, to get people's records and all of that. The issue is we put it out to the public domain for consultations, not a word from them, not a suggestion as to how we can improve. Two weeks it's out in the public domain. You can read these bills in a couple of hours. Oh, that's too short a time. We put out the PSA with big issue about the PSA 
Imagine the whole country has been debating this for the last seven years about Ra Rafael Trotman's PSA, the same one that Glenn Lyle talks about every day. We put out a new PSA uh, draft, show, moving the royalty from 2% to 10%, the corporate tax from 0 to 10%, reducing the, the amount for cost recovery from 75% to 65%. And, um, and then the 50-50 arrangement, 50-50 profit. And um, they complain a lot. We have a lot of views, but not a single suggestion. Again, not a single suggestion. We then put out the Petroleum Activities Bill to replace the 1986 law. Oh, they have a lot of issues with it at a press conference, but will not take time to say, here are the issues we have with it. So in this country, you have a lot of people who make a lot of noise and the opposition leads among this. But when it comes time to do the heavy lifting, the hard work of changing things, getting the technical work done, they don't, they don't want to participate in that. They can't participate because of the paucity of skills too. And so they're, they're more inclined for pageantry, the protest action, um, etc., the pageantry, gimmickry, etc., rather than dealing with it what it, a serious opposition should be doing. You recall when we were in opposition, we made it clear that anything that the government did that enhanced people's rights and benefits to them, we will support. However, we will be uh, fighting the things that were inimical to the interests of people. When they put more taxes on the mining sector, we fought those. When they put taxes on water and electricity and data and 200 other items, we fought those. We fought the banning of used tires. We fought the removal of the subsidy from, from the pensioners. We fought the removal of the 10,000 grant from the kids. We exposed the huge amount of money they were spending on rentals to people who were close to them. We exposed the amount of money the growth in the budget for purchase of vehicles in that period. We exposed the corruption, uh, the 600 million that was missing from the Durban Park. That is what we did in opposition. We, we went after every bill that was debated in parliament. We had a view. We expressed that view before that we went into parliament in great details. And then in parliament, we fought it aggressively. So they, they're up for, as I said before, the pageantry and all these matters. Dr. Jagir, one of the concerns um, citizens have had and um, was of recent, um, citizens have become very mobile as a result of electric uh, bikes. Yes. And recently um, laws were enacted um, to see some format being created for control through GRE and with the police license. Yes. Um, that has caused a lot of yeah, discomfort. Yes, this issue came up where in many parts of the country that I visited. You're absolutely right about it. And there are two groups of people out there. Some who believe that there should be no rules governing these the use of these bikes and then another group that have reasonably expressed some concerns that the process of registration um, could be used as an opportunity for bureaucracy and it could be costly uh, but they are concerned they they share the concern that we have, that something has to be done about safety. So I'm inclined to work with the second group. So since this matter has been raised, we've been having discussions and I want to assure people 
that whatever emerges, and we're working on this now, we have to deal with a safety issue. A lot of people are getting killed on the road because of the lack of safety measures. These bikes are not ordinary bikes. Not the pedal one I'm talking about. Not the ones that are pedaled, the motorized ones that don't have pedals. So they're similar to a moto, like a motorbike. When they come on the public road, remember there are other users and these are silent because they're electric bikes. So we have to ensure that we can keep the people safe and also others from having accidents with the bike, the people on the bike safe, etc. But we are not interested in one collecting taxes. We don't want money for registration from these people. So let me make that clear. You know, that is not a revenue earning measure. I think the idea was to register to bring some control. We have to make this process a simple process. We have to put in some rules in place that would ensure safety, but without it becoming burdensome to people. So they need to give us some time to work this through on the ground. The GRA, I spoke with the Commissioner General, they're not going to rush people in by a, a part. I think there's a deadline now. The GRA, the Commissioner General said they can be a bit flexible on this matter whilst we're working this issue through. But we have to be balanced here. The last thing you want to do is, and, and from what I heard, in some cases, kids are using these things too, even small children coming onto the main road. It is, we got we to gotta have some safety measures in place for their own protection, for the protection of the people too, who are riding these bikes. It's not a repressive measure of the state, and, and whatever is done in that, in the manner, and to enhance safety, because that's our primary concern, would be done in a way that don't, people don't feel harassed on the ground. You know, if the, the traditional licensing system has been one where they get harassed and all of that, we will make this a smooth process, because the idea is not to, a punitive one to punish people. We want them to use these bikes, but in a safe way. We're going to address it. Dr. Chad, you, you continue, um, and our position has made these claims, that you continue, you're on the ground. Are you still in campaign mode? You're, you're visiting, and you're, you're said you're following up on promises made to people yes. during the local government and before local government yes, election. Yes. Um, recently, you, you visited the front road, the new boulevard there that has transformed that community. Um, what can people expect specifically in Georgetown? Now, councillors have been sworn in and the government has been doing a lot, even without not having control of Georgetown. What can the residents of Georgetown expect? Well, they can expect us to fulfill all of our promises, contrary to what Apno told them but not just in Georgetown, in the entire country, with the promises we made. And um, I went to Nung Lane Avenue because I had promised them to visit and to work on a project with them prior to the elections. But I also visited Yarrow Dam, which is an extension of Lane Avenue, going up all the way to the police station. And the people there, we will be working with people in the communities to ensure that their communities get better. Um, I also did an impromptu visit into Enterprise a couple of days ago. I drove in there one night. Um, I didn't tell anyone. And I found one of the worst roads in the country driving in there. And it was a coming in the Colgitan Road and going into the Enterprise community. They have other access roads, but um, going in and be, most people use those. So I took back the minute, I took the minister there and met um, the people who live along the road and we're fixing that road. But also I just stopped in at a, and had a, a good meeting with the community and within an hour, 
there were a large number of people there and they raised several concerns with me. And so I asked Frank Anthony and Anil Nandalal uh, in there to go back and they went back yesterday and a lot of the matters are being addressed. So we need, we need to do more of this. Being on the ground allows us to in, interact with people and you see firsthand the challenges. Sometimes it's impossible to do this all the time, but it is something that we promise people to do on the ground. And, and, and often what you find on the ground is are things that should never happen in our government, should never happen on the government. I had, um, there's a woman from my village. My sister brought me the document and she said, this person is 80 something years old and she had her pension up to the, in the first three months of the year. And then suddenly they told her something is wrong with her book. And so she didn't get her pension for the rest of the month, for the, for the past three or four months. I know how this would bother a person of that age if they can't receive their monthly pension. And so I called the minister, Vindya Pasad, Dr. Pasad, and she went, she said to me, go to Enmore. And she went to Enmore. She told me that it was just callous behavior, that they had about 200 books or so where some stamp did not match the number on the book. And instead of sorting it out immediately, they just sat on it because they're bureaucrats. They don't give a damn about this lady or maybe 200 others in this country, pensioners who can't get their money because they get paid every month. They get their salary, they sit in an office. And then it's being sort out, sorted out immediately. The minister went down. I got word yesterday that the same day she went there, the woman got called at three o'clock to go. Her, her pension book is ready, the updated one. Now, this sort of thing should never happen. But if we didn't, if didn't come, this didn't come to me through my sister from the village where she brought this, I, would have, I wouldn't have known and you would have had a number of pensioners suffering because of some bureaucracy. And this happens routinely. <clears throat> this happens routinely in many government agencies. NIS, we've had to intervene on hundreds of cases with NIS. The same thing, you, you saw the Carlos kind of um, letter that went out to the market vendors at um, on the railway embankment at Pleasance. You know, seven days you have to get off the property. This is government property. Just creating more trouble for us. So we need to look into these things more often, but sometimes it becomes burdensome because you expect people who are being paid to do their job and to do so conscientiously, not to put, create hardships for people, but to assist them. And the same thing, you know, like, and, and then we, we had just yesterday, uh, somebody called me and they put a contractor on the line. And um, the contractor told me that one person from a particular tender board was trying to shake him down for paying, he won a contract and they went to ask, ask him for money, a bribe on the side. So I told the minister and that person will no longer have a job today. This is the sort of thing where we get a lot of heat in the government for things that sometimes you don't even have a clue about. Like, like the pension issue. We wouldn't have known, the minister wouldn't have known had it not, had, had this not been brought to our attention from the ground. So there are lots of those things that bother me where the system should be working for people. System should be working. And often 
it doesn't happen because people who get paid to carry out their responsibilities do not do so conscientiously. Dr. Jadio, on that point, um, one last question. Knowing you got to yes, I got to rush. Yes, Blinken. Um, is your government? I'm hearing about the issue, and you recognize it. But yourself and the president have set the standard so high in terms of meeting people and personally delivering on issues. Is the government doing any introspection as it relates to these same issues and inefficiency within the government and even by this some is government not inefficiency. Ministers? This is not inefficiency. We made efficient, more efficient the pension system. We increased the pension by $13,000 a month since we got into office. We increased it by that. We put in more offices. We made the place better for many of the pensioners to come to. So now we're trying to synchronize the two pensions, NIS and public, um, the old age pension. It is individual. These are individuals. It's not a system. This, this is the work of individuals who will never say, okay, you have a problem, let me fix this now, because there are 200 people here who have a similar problem. Let me pursue it to the end so this old woman can get her book now or get her pension. That's not a systemic problem. It's about the functioning, and it's, it boils down back to people doing their job. How does the government plan that, to that's very, that's, to that's, that? But you can't do that with the policy. The policy can put in place the system. It means now that people have to be held more responsible for that. We have to start firing some of these people who will do these things. We have to start doing that. You hear a lot of gripe when you fire some of these individuals. But you have to do that. Uh, that's the only way that I think people will will do what they're paid to do in many cases. You know, you put in 18 hours of work a day sometimes just to get things, people's issues resolved. And somebody sits at their office and sits on a stack of paper and they, all I have to do is sign something. And they take three weeks to sign a document that's on their desk. And people's lives out there, they just... Are, are on hold because of this. And lots of agencies, it's like that. And then they blame the system. They always blame, oh, it's some minister. Every, or it's somebody else responsible. So that's where holding people personally more accountable for performance is vital as we move forward. That is an important thing we'd have to start doing. Dr. Jardy, I would like to thank you uh, close on that point and yes. thank you for this opportunity yeah. of transparency and accountability. By thank, the thank you. And, and as I said before, um, I'll do the press briefing at, at some other point in time. Thank you. Dr. Right, thanks. Thank you.